Hey everybody, it is Trags Mike Petralia back with the latest episode of the Jungle Roar podcast powered by CLNS Media and Prize Picks, the largest daily fantasy sports platform in all of North America. Back here to talk Bengals football and a lot of rule changes, actually a couple of significant ones just approved by NFL owners in the owners meetings down in Orlando, Florida, is the one and only James Rapine. You can catch his outstanding work on all Bengals uh, dot com, the Locked On uh, Bengals uh, podcast, of course, a daily podcast. How you doing, James? I'm great. Trags, how are you? I'm doing well. Um, for the off season, this is the kind of uh, type of uh, or time of year where it starts to really heat up. We've just made it through really the first big wave of free agency. Want to get your thoughts on that? And now we start to really gear up with all of the college pro days all around the country as NFL coaches and GMs make their way around the, to different college campuses. We get ready for the NFL draft at the end of April. It'll be in Detroit this year. Um, I want to get your thoughts, first of all, on what you think of the Bengals free agency period uh, so far. I like what they've done a lot, actually. I do too. And I think it's it, it resembles really from the jump. It resembled what they did in 2021 when they had targeted players that they thought would fit and they found really good value. And Zach Moss, for example, uh, is, is someone that two years, $8 million, they feel like is a really good fit in their offense. Mike Gesicki helps make up for what I think a lot of us assume is the loss of Tyler Boyd and gives them a dynamic tight end that they, they really haven't had in the passing game, not to the, right. at the level of Gesicki, but really from the jump, whether it was Geno Stone, uh, whether it was going after a guy in Sheldon Rankins who they have pursued in the past, they identified free agents, veterans that they thought would be good fit, that would fit well in their scheme, that were still really talented, that might be pushing 30 in some instances like Rankins or just over 30 like Trent Brown, but presented good value overall. So I like what they did. I don't think they're complete by any stretch, but I do think they're better today than they were, say, November 1, pre-Joe Burrow's injury, I, I like the roster better, and I, I do think they improved, and they have better fits on their team at, at quality values. They didn't overpay for any of their free agent additions. Another aspect of their free agent signings that I liked is a term that actually Trent Brown used with us in his uh, Zoom call uh, last week, and that was plug-and-play. He thinks he's going to be a good plug-and-play fit for one year uh, in the Bengals uh, on the Bengals' offensive line. That's a right tackle. He is the presumptive starting right tackle going into 2024. But I think you could use plug-and-play to really uh, describe the rest of the – or many of the free agent signings. No doubt. No doubt. I, I think Zach Moss probably starts – even though there, there isn't necessarily a starting, you're going to use more than one running back, so I don't think right. that matters. But they added a starter there. Mike Gesicki, a starter. Obviously, Trent Brown, Sheldon Rankin, starter, starter. Von Bell, Geno Stone, at least one of them will start. Maybe both start. Who knows, right? And, and so, yeah, it, it was a very plug-and-play free agent class, guys that are going to contribute right away. And they haven't committed long-term to any of these guys. That's Even Geno correct. Stone, who's correct. entering his prime, it's only a two-year deal. And so I, I think that is the big difference between 2021 and this year. Is Mike Hilton was a four-year deal. Chidobe Awuzie was a three-year deal. Trey Hendrickson was a four-year deal. This year, I, I think that the, the free agent class in general was a bit older. So they went shorter term with a lot of these guys. And that's fine. Because you know what? You look ahead, and of course you know me, Trags. I'm looking ahead. They have a lot of cap space next year. Mike Petraglia. Mike Petraglia. Mike Petraglia. Um, silent they G, do. thank you. Yes. Uh, th I know it is a silent G. It's like lasagna. I know you know. Just continue. You a gangsta. But the point is, they have a lot of money to spend next year as well. And so even with a Jamar Chase extension that I'm sure they want to get done, even with insert whatever you want to, to say they'll do, this Bengals team is in position to spend again next year, which is a beautiful thing as Joe yep. Burrow's extension kicks in and as they get ready to prepare, uh, uh, get prepared to pay Jamar. Yes. And I think what's very important to take into account uh, is they are trying to save as much cap space as possible to leave themselves flexibility. They are going to get Jamar chased on. I would be shocked 
uh, if they didn't get a long-term deal done with Jamar, knowing what he means to Joe Burrow. I think they want to get that deal done. And I think the fact that the Bengals are going with one- and two-year deals, meaning they're not kicking the can down the road in really any of these contracts, leaves them enough flexibility to get those or get that one deal done. And who knows about T or whether or not they bring in somebody else after next year. But they need that flexibility. That is another reason, James, you would agree, right, that they're doing these shorter-term deals? Yeah, and and I, I think you're you're right about one thing specifically. The fact that they they let themselves so much room, it gives them flexibility. Let's say T. Higgins goes out there. Let's say they sign Jamar Chase, like you said. Right. And then T. Higgins goes out there and has 1,300 yards. And Jamar Chase balls out. And it shows, oh, my God, we have these this two-headed monster. They have the money for one season to tag T. Higgins again. Right. Pay Jamar Chase, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Let's just say it's the fifth-year option, which is basically 21. It's what T's making this year. So $21 million and have T at $26 million on a second franchise tag, plus Burroughs, et cetera. Like, they can do all of those things for one year. It's really hard to do it and commit to it for multiple years. But let's say T. Higgins just exceeds his value and raises his profile to a level where they say, hey, it's worth keeping him for another year. They do have that option. I don't think it's re super realistic because, to your point, especially in this year's class, there's a lot of wide receivers. There's a lot of weapons that have me just saying, hmm, that wouldn't be interesting in stripes. But they do have that option. And keeping that long-term flexibility is important because I do think in the short term, they've gotten better and improved on their weaknesses. Long-term, they have that flexibility that they need to pivot if and when needed. I know you were one of the very first to push the Justin Jefferson um, theory. Years ago. Years, years ago. ago. Three, yeah. Probably three years ago. Yeah. Do Two, you still I believe think. in that? I believe that if Justin Jefferson, all of that was put into place and based on Justin Jefferson getting unhappy in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And what you called that still needs to fully happen. I do think he's waiting on a deal and frustrated. He's played it very cool. He hasn't really come out and gone scorched earth on the Minnesota Vikings, correct? Now, and I'm going to be very clear here. Yep. If the opportunity does arise, Joe needs to be in. Jamar yep. needs to be in. Yep. All hands on deck to make it work. Because if there's anyone that's worth paying two receivers and a high-end quarterback. If there's any trio that's worth that, it is Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, and Joe Burrow. Or Never. Burrow Chase Jefferson, or Burrow Jefferson Chase. However you want to do it. I would Together. do it all day long. Correct. Yes. If you can do it, if it can be done, you do it, and you think about the rest of the team afterwards. Because there would be a lot of people that say, that's not how you build a team. No. These guys are different. So is it likely? No. It's highly unlikely. I do think, though, that there could be a point at some point during their career where it does does happen. And, and if if, Jeff's, if Jefferson does get unhappy, unhappier sooner rather than later, and and gets has to go scorched earth, I do think that the Bengals would be number one on his list for obvious reasons. Yeah, I do too, and I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. However, that being said, I don't think it's likely. I think the most likely scenario is the scenario that will unfold. And that is T Higgins uh, playing under his tag uh, and Jamar chase playing alongside Joe Burrow. Let's get to Joe Burrow. Zach Taylor said uh, on Tuesday at the NFL owners meetings in Orlando that he's making very good progress. He's making the kind of progress they were hoping to see uh, ever since he suffered the injury uh, in mid-November against Baltimore. Uh, your reaction to what uh, Zach Taylor had to say, and if uh, you, uh, with him saying those words on Tuesday, how significant you think that is for Joe Burrow's uh, rehab? No, it's extremely significant. And I think Burrow's trending exactly where he had hoped. I think he, I've been told he has thrown, not a ton, not doing a full throwing gauntlet of throws like he does pregame for example but I, I do think he is throwing the football now it, which isn't a shock if you saw that some of those workout videos that black sheep posted where he's gripping 40 pound dumbbells with that surgically repaired right wrist and hand no I, I think everything is going in the right direction and he'll slowly ramp up and 
I think we're going to see video of him throwing probably certainly by OTAs when we're there during the offseason yeah. program, but maybe even sooner than that. I, I really do because he's right now, I think he's, he's feeling things out, seeing what he can do and, and taking it slow, but he's going to ramp up over the next six weeks or so. And I, I do expect to see him out there throwing at OTAs, even though even then they may have the, the, the guard up and, and go pretty precautionary with him and, and take be cautious because he should <laughs> let, let let's be honest here you just want him for for camp and and you want him to ramp up in camp and be ready right. to go week one not the other way i think the past couple of training camps joe burrow has been week one ready and in late july i thought he looked awesome before he injured his calf that first day of practice yes. might right, have been correct. the best i've seen joe burrow look like it's fast explosive throwing darts like his arm looked live and it's, it was like, whoa, like he's playing at a, an elite level. You want him to be doing that in the second week of September, <laughs> not right. necessarily now, the last week of July. Not that it's bad, of course, if he's playing at that level in July, but you just, he he's, he's probably going to tweak things a bit to where he's taking his time and easing into things. I want to see him play at least one preseason game. How about you? No. Are you kidding? He better not. I mean, I know he wants to play. No. The, the, the only reason I say yeah. that, <laughs> uh, the only reason I say that, James, is I think you give him some momentum going into a seat. I don't think. Nope. nope. Okay. I, I'm not going to convince I'm you otherwise. Opposite. If something ha what's the risk? The risk versus reward. What's the reward? I think the risk is very minimal. I think the idea of getting him out there on the field, seeing defense, well, not forget that, actually throwing the ball <laughs> around, actually the timing of his game is yeah. really where I think it would benefit him because in the last two years, I don't think he has come out and been particularly ready for this injury. I understand that, but I think it would behoove him to have some live action under his belt before he goes in to week one. I just think there's more downside than there is upside to it. And I, I get it. You want to hit the ground running and be firing on all cylinders on offense, but T Higgins is not playing in the preseason. I'll break that news right now. I mean, unless you get the long-term deal done, Jamar chase, it's probably based on an extension as well. And with burrow, it's just the injury factor. Why do it when you can simulate a lot of it in practice and to me, it's all about having a healthy Joe Burrow week one. The reason they got off to a slow start last year ha had more to do with health than it had to do with the preseason. But to your point, they were going to play Joe last year. That was the plan, to play him in a series or two. He certainly wants to do it. So it wouldn't shock me if they go that route. I'm totally okay, and I've been this way the past couple of years. Totally okay seeing Joe on the bench and uh, seeing him for the first time week one. All right, let's get to uh, the prospects that the uh, Bengals are certainly going to be looking at uh, in terms of the upcoming draft, uh, again, at the end of April in Detroit. There are two areas to me that stick out as glaring priorities. Offensive tackle for the future. Obviously, you have Trent Brown on a one-year prove-it-to-me deal. Offensive tackle, right tackle, and defensive tackle, interior. They obviously, with Sheldon Rankin's uh, addressed one area uh, in terms of the three technique, getting after the uh, quarterback, Sheldon Rank has certainly has proven over the years he can be not only disruptive getting after the quarterback, but forcing fumbles. He's a very active defensive lineman. They need another, and they need somebody young. And certainly the name that uh, has come up in the last couple of days, Byron Murphy out of the University of Texas, Longhorn. Zach Taylor was at his pro day last week. Uh, your thoughts on Byron Murphy and how he might fit uh, in the Bengals system. Yeah, I, I certainly think that the Bengals could break the streak of, let, let me do the math, 30 years. It would be a 30-year yes. gap of not taking a defensive tackle. Yeah, Dan Big Daddy Wilkinson, who was ended up being a good player, by the way. Didn't very, up to the number very one. good. Uh, you know, yeah. good to very good, but he was just yeah. never the number one overall pick that I think a lot of, Bengal fans no hoped he would. They thought back in the day, and I remember this in 94, they thought if if you could use the current day model, he would be Aaron Donald. 
mm-hmm. and he he never turned into that. No, 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 no. And or Warren Sapp, maybe you know Warren, Warren Sapp, Sapp is a similar. Yes, is it, a much better comp. Yes, go yeah, ahead. Yep. And uh, heck, Warren Sapp should have been a Bengal once upon a time. Yeah. In, in this in, in this era of Bengals, Warren Sapp does become a Bengal. They get that deal done with him. Anyways, yeah. I I do think that Byron Murphy is very much on their radar. And coming out of the combine, it felt like, and this isn't just Bengals wise. I think NFL wise. He was looked at as the best defensive tackle in this class, ahead of Johnny Newton, ahead of Tavondre Sweat, his teammate at Texas, ahead of all of these guys. And so we'll see. I think it's really interesting because if you asked most Bengals fans that follow the draft, I think they want Johnny Newton out of Illinois. I think the NFL is higher on Byron Murphy. Will Byron be there at 18? Will he be the best player on the Bengals board at 18? It's interesting because to me, you can find some of these interior pass rushers on the first couple of days of the draft. And it's not just at pick 18. What's really hard to find is those big nose tackle types. And you're not taking Tavondre Sweat at 18 anyway in round one. So I I do wonder if the Bengals are willing to pass on a Byron Murphy, but would not shock me at all if he's very much in play as well at pick 18. Yeah, and I I think it's very interesting given the fact that the Bengals have 10 draft picks uh, in this uh, selection process. How do they use them and do they do something that they don't often do? And that is uh, move around the uh, draft board and, you know, spend some of the draft capital and move up in, in some particular cases. What they usually like to do, they don't. And you know this very well, James, they don't usually move up, almost never move up in the first round, but they will move up in rounds two, three, four uh, to get a player that they feel might be coming off the board. Yep. I agree. And I think that's, that's what makes it really interesting. If they have seven defensive tackles that they think could fall and be in that 49 range in round two, pick 49 or pick 80 round three, and they have two third rounders they say, Oh, well we have the ammo to move up from 80 to 75 if we need to, but there aren't many offensive tackles that we think will be there. So let's take one at 18. Or let's take one at 49. I think wide receiver is interesting as well because a lot of people are overlooking it. To me, the sweet spot might be pick 49. They're going to go. Everyone talks about the depth. When there's depth at a position, Trags, you know what happens? Teams get it. They get their guy. They don't wait around because they know that it's going to fly off the board. And I, I think there's a cliff for offensive tackle and there's a cliff for wide receiver. And defensive tackle you might be able to look up and find one at pick 80 or at pick 97. So how they juggle that, how they balance that, I think is really interesting because we know their needs. Everyone knows. And at the same time, I think there are at least a few players that would surprise people in round one. And part of that might have to do with the depth that some of these other spots in rounds two through four. Joe Alt of uh, Notre Dame is not going to be available as a tackle. We know that when the Bengals uh, get to 18, when they pick 18, he is uh, presumably the presumptive first offensive tackle to come off the board. Do you agree with that, James? I mean, oh, no doubt. I th- yeah. I actually think that the Tennessee Titans will take Joe Alt as of hmm. today if he's there. That would be my prediction. And where do they pick? Seventh. Seventh. You think he's going to last to seven? If he makes it to seven. That's another good point. Well, the first three are quarterback. I, you know, I do think the first three teams uh, are picking quarterbacks. You agree with that? I do. And I think the fourth could as well. Like if you're the Minnesota Vikings, you're trying to move up. I think the Broncos are trying to move up. I think we're going to see some movement and the chargers could certainly trade down. Uh, the, the Cardinals certainly could trade down. And, and so those are two teams to keep an eye on as far as trade downs are concerned. The Patriots, they better stand pat and take a quarterback. I would think, given what I've heard coming out of New England, that's the most likely scenario. Um, though I do think they are very tempted to take Marvin Harrison Jr. out of uh, Ohio State. I think there's a temptation there simply because I think he is the best NFL-ready player on the board along with Joe Alt. I could be wrong, but if you have a a Marvin Harrison Jr., I think you have a transformative wide receiver. Yeah, I I agree with you. And I think he reminds me, he's almost as surefire as like A.J. Green, Julio Jones. 
Yep. Like those are the two, like the size, speed, downfield ability. Hands. I remember that that 2011 draft. And there were a lot of Bengals fans that wanted the Bengals to trade back. And I think Cleveland was the team that traded back with Atlanta. And they're like, oh, you could have gotten all of those things. And it's like, no, take the player. Absolutely and, agree with that. <laughs> and so if you're the Patriots, I, I get taken Marvin Harrison Jr., but what is your plan at quarterback? Is it, oh, you really like Bo Nix? Or you really like Michael Penix Jr.? You, you, you need to have that, that element in place because the Bengals, they evaluated it right in that draft. They said, oh, well, we love A.J. Green. Cam Newton was a top player on their board. A.J. Green was second. We love A.J. Green. So they take A.J. Green fourth, right play. And then they get one of the best quarterbacks in the draft, probably the second best quarterback in that draft, and Andy Dalton. I picked 35, I believe it was, 36. Mm -hmm. And all these other quarterbacks went ahead uh, of, of Andy, and it didn't matter. He was better than all of them. So trust your evaluations. But if, if there's a clear drop-off at, at quarterback, then you probably got to take one. Because without a quarterback, we've seen it here in Cincinnati. Joe Burrow completely tra transformed the franchise. And would have done that without Jamar Chase. It always helps to have a Jamar Chase, but uh, certainly it's something that they they should prioritize. So that, that's my quarterback rant and how you build teams. He is James Rapine. Uh, does a fabulous job on the Locked On Bengals podcast, also allbengals.com. I was on uh, with the one and only James Rapine on ESPN 1530 on Tuesday, and you asked me, what is the most likely scenario at 18? I said offensive tackle. And assuming, James Rapine, that Joe Alt is off the board, which obviously will be, I'm going to give you a couple of names and give me the one uh, offensive tackle that stands out the most to you and would excite you the most as a Bengal fan. Talese Fuaga, Oregon State. Um, Troy Fatanu of Washington. Uh, Olu Fashanu of Penn State. J.C. Latham of Alabama. Amarius Mims of Georgia. Of those guys, I think Talese Fuaga is the most intriguing. And, and I think he could come in and start right away. And it, it depends. You know, do you think that he's just a, a straight up tackle? I think he could play guard right away. And so do you try him at guard and try to put your best five out there? Or do you just put him at right tackle right away and use Trent Brown as a swing tackle because they're not paying him a lot of money? So I think Talese hmm. Fuaga would be my guy. If, if if of that group, if you could pick one to fall, it's him. I don't think he will fall because I do think he's, we talked about plug and play with three agents. I think he's about as plug and play as you can get at tackle and or guard, which is a beautiful place to be in. So if he's there, uh, I think they take him. That said, I think they'll be really high on JC Latham. Powerful, the size, uh, certainly the potential in this this power run scheme this gap scheme that they they've kind of transformed into another guy that I, I really like. I like Amarius Mims. I, I think that people look at the the inexperience fine, but you don't find guys like that. And, and he is a unique, rare talent and getting him into the building, maybe not needing him to start right away with Trent Brown, certainly someone that they will seriously consider would not shock me if, any of those guys are are their first round pick. And I, I think that at least one will be there for sure. I think Mims will certainly be there. JC Latham could be there. Fuaga is the one that's a long shot to me. But if he's there, you probably do a little dance on your way up to the podium because your offensive line just got a lot better. Rule changes. Let's get to that real quick. Uh, what do you think of the new kickoff rule? I will give you a chance to respond and then we'll get into the details. Yeah, I think that... Uh, it's going to change the way teams build their team. And when the Bengals are looking at wide receivers, cornerbacks, and running backs in this draft class, can you return kicks? How do you return kicks? Are you good at breaking tackles? I think that that element could matter. I think Chris Evans and Travion Williams, they have a shot now to show right. that they can be the long-term kick returner for this team. Obviously, Charlie Jones is in that mix as well. So I like it. I want the kickoffs to matter. I don't want to... Uh, this is a bathroom break and, and go to the stop bothering you in the press box and being able to go to the bathroom. No, I want to be able to be in my seat, paying attention to the kickoff because it's important. So I, I think the NFL is trying to do that in a safe way. So I like it. 
Uh, let me make one thing very clear. I don't think this was done as much for player safety, even though Roger Goodell certainly wants to get that point across. I don't think it was done nearly as much for safety as it was for making the play relevant again. They did not. I, I forgot about this. There was not a single kickoff return in Super Bowl 58. Insane. It's insane that that's the case. I it should matter. It should matter. And yes, the play shouldn't. I, I agree. The, and I think the Steelers made a very savvy move adding Cordero Patterson the moment that happened. Did you see that? I, I was, did. I was like, oh, that's, that's such a, a Steelers move. It is a Steelers move. Reading the market, they they, they do that yeah. incredibly well. They Go do. Ahead. I, I it, it was like, God, are you serious? <laughs> because I would have taken him with open arms, welcomed him with open arms. I, I loved. Uh, I love Cordero Patterson once upon a time in, in pre-draft season and in the NFL used him wrong for many, many years, but he's still a productive player and can contribute to a winner. No doubt. I mean, he's, he may not be Devin Hester, but he's probably the next step below, right? You would agree. Yeah. So, something like that. I agree with you. Yeah. Kickoffs kickoffs will remain at the 35 yard line, but the remaining 10 players on the kicking unit will line up on the opposing team's 40 yard line. The receiving team lines up with at least seven players in the setup zone. That's a five yard area between their own 35 and 30 yard lines with a maximum of two returners who can line up in the landing zone. After the ball is kicked, the kicker cannot cross the 50 yard line uh, and the kick 10 Kicking team players cannot move until the ball hits the ground or a player in the landing zone goes into the end zone. Here are some, very quickly, some kickoff scenarios. Kickoffs that hit in the landing zone must be returned. Kickoffs that hit in the landing zone and then go into the end zone must be returned or down by the receiving team. Kickoffs um, short of the landing zone would be treated like a kickoff out of bounds. I find this interesting. And the receiving team would get the ball at its own 40-yard line. Here's what I have to ask you. I think there will be teams, James, that say, screw it. We'll give up the extra 10 yards, kick the ball through the end zone, and start at the 30 instead of the 20. That's one of the the trade-offs, if you will, if you want to just say, screw it. We're not going to deal with um, worrying about a potential speedster getting through our first line and having a touchdown scored on us. Yeah, I think... If you're the Bengals, you welcome that with open arms because you're a few pass plays away from getting into field goal range for Evan McPherson. And and that's the other element here is you want someone that's a big enough threat to tempt teams to do that. Can you imagine if Joe Burrow just starts every drive at the 30? You're going to score a lot of points. So, it, you know, I, you I think a lot of fans, James, don't think that's a big deal, but that 10 yards is a big deal because it's a first down. And like you said, oh. at... At the You're end first of first down games, away from being by the logo. You, you think of it that way. Right. And you pick up 13 yards, you're on the logo. Two first downs for a lot of teams from being in field goal range. And mm -hmm. at the end of games, that obviously is to me when this rule is going to matter the most. And so the other thing that it does is it challenges Evan McPherson and the kickoff team to be crisp. And I'm sure Darren Simmons loves this because it's a challenge in in it makes it interesting and it makes him more valuable. And at the same time, it's going to be, there's going to be some headaches that come with it because they're going to give up long returns or they're going to give Lamar Jackson the ball at the 30 with Justin Tucker 25 yards away from his range. You know, it's just, it's, it's wild to think about, but yeah, that, that yardage does matter. And so you want to have, if you're the Bengals, a big enough threat to ensure that teams consider, Hey, should we just kick it to the back of the end zone? It might be worth it to give them the ball in the 30, because if so, it's a heck of a place to start each and every job. Here's my thought on the hip drop tackle, uh, essentially being banned from the NFL. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great idea. Obviously, it was unanimous uh, by the competition committee. It's a safety issue. It's a legit safety issue. What Logan Wilson did last year, I, he doesn't play the game dirty, but that play is, there's a difference, I think we can agree, between dirty and dangerous and the play on Mark Andrews essentially ended his regular season uh, in Baltimore. That one My, wasn't illegal though. They, it they came was out not Ill that. What say they, that again. They came, they came out and said that one would not be flagged under these new rules. Oh, well, I did not see that. So thank you, James, for pointing so, that out. So it, it, it's, it, that's, what's interesting. That's what scares me about this is the subjectivity to it. 
Okay, because everyone correct. Assumed, that's what I'm getting to. And, and, and so that's that part is scary because it's an automatic first down. If you're trying to tackle Jamar Chase, well, good freaking luck. Okay, fourth fourth down and thirteen, and you try to tackle him, and he he catches an eight yard pass. You, you try to get him down any way you can, right? Well, you do the hip drop to try to prevent him from getting that extra yard, and now it's an automatic first down. So I think it makes it much tougher on the defense. And so if I'm the Bengals, what I think is, all right, I want guys that are good yak guys. Brock Bowers, great yak guy. Malachi Corley, good yak guy. Can I find these explosive guys that are really hard to bring down because defenders are going to think twice over the next year or two as they adjust? So here's my point on that. Don't have the officials. They already have a tough enough job. Don't force them to interpret what a hip. That is not a straightforward call. You would agree, James? No doubt. I mean, it's not straightforward, straightforward. and you're asking the officials with games uh, happening at lightning speed quickness out on the field to make that call on a dime. I I think that's totally unrealistic. If you want to enforce it, enforce it like you do, personal fouls. The, The league reviews the film, and if they deem it unnecessary or uh, dangerous, then find the player and leave it at that. Don't, Mm -hmm. I, I am not in favor of teams being penalized yardage with this rule. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think it's tough. It's a, a tough situation. Hopefully, hopefully it doesn't show up too much. I just hope hope common sense prevails in this regard. We got to go here, James. Uh, We covered a ton of material. I appreciate you joining me. Anything you want to push before I let you go? Locked on Bengals. The Daily Bengals podcast, Cincinnati Bengals talk on YouTube and uh, all of our coverage at SI.com. He is the one and only James Rapine does a fabulous job covering your Cincinnati Bengals on a daily basis. And I'm Mike Petralia. Trags, thanks for uh, downloading this episode of the Jungle Roar podcast. You can follow our content all over the map uh, at CLNS Media, including our YouTube page. That's youtube.com at Cincinnati Sports Studio, all one word. Until next week, keep that jungle roaring.